Where are these plastics used to replace metal? Welcome back to the show, guys. Today, we're gonna to be talking about metal replacement thermoplastics. It's about what does that actually mean? Uh, a metal replacement, is this as strong as steel? Well, technically by volume, but it's not exactly as it sounds. So let's just clarify and demystify a little bit of this coal. Can you replace metal with plastic? Think about that. I don't see any way it's possible for a plastic to be as strong as a metal. 100% infill peak, maybe in certain axes. Basically, if you take peak, it's as strong as steel by volume. Now, getting a piece of peak, the same volume as steel. Density. And, and, and by weight, density, right. It's gonna be way lighter. Let's just dive right in and talk about where are these you know, plastics used to replace metal. One application we see a lot of is parts that are going into space where you can't use metal and it needs to be super light and it needs to be radio transparent so that radio waves can go through it or it needs to be resistant to gamma radiation or something like that or corrosion and chemical resistance where all these thermoplastics like PEAK and ULTIM and PPSU really excel whereas uh, mild steel or something like that might be stronger and easier to manufacture but they cannot be used for one reason or another. So it's not like you're just gonna wanna take your part and say I wanna 3D print it, let's use PEAK because it's the best. Um, it's more about specific applications throughout many different industries where these plastics have been used for 30 years and they're able to be used in specific situations. So I heard the Air Force, I saw a white paper about it a while ago, Lysus 9085, and they were using it in door mechanisms for a helicopter. My thought process is it's going to be lighter, it saves a lot of weight. Is it going to be as strong as the metal that it's replacing? Probably not. But it's strong enough, meaning it's a thermoplastic that's strong enough to use this application and it doesn't need to be metal. Right, right. Which saves weight and material. Uh, and in a lot of those situations, it is much more lightweight than its metal counterparts. So in aircraft, you know, you wanna save as much weight as possible, that's a big deal. Um, some things that we see a lot of are implants. In the US, that's mostly veterinarian implants since the FDA is crazy, or in other countries, we do see human implants. Um, but the biocompatibility of PEAK is a big deal and it's lightweight and it's super strong and it's got wear properties. I feel like a better term is going to be metal alternative because it doesn't do the exact same thing as metal. It's like, okay, if I take a metal, a steel bar that's this big and a PEAK bar that's this big, if they're both solid, yeah, that's going to be similar in strength but in general, it's gonna be a thousand times easier and quicker and more affordable to make that part out of metal if you can. So it's not like you just yeah. want to replace your metal parts with peak. It's more like, I need the strength and a lot of the you know, aspects of metal in this part, but it has to have these other properties. Uh, one of the terms that we see thrown around a lot is the UL94 V0 FST rating, which is a flame smoke toxicity rating, which means basically if it's a V0, then it's gonna self extinguish and when it off gases, the smoke is gonna be very little smoke and it'll be less toxic than other alternatives and things like that. So it's used in situations like aircraft because it's lightweight, it's super strong and it self extinguishes. Now, if you're using steel, great, it would work fantastic, but you can't just put a bunch of steel parts onto an aircraft because you gotta save that weight. So that's one of the primary factors there. One thing I've seen a lot is people have been using Peak for 30 years and they'll come to us because they're manufacturing these parts and they'll be CNCing them or trying to injection, molding, uh, injection mold them. And Peak in particular, uh, unlike Ultim 985, is semi-crystalline. So it likes to form crystalline structures within it and then it likes to warp and, and bend and, and move in different ways when it cools down. So if you're gonna injection mold it, first off you gotta have an injection uh, mold that's super, super high temp. And then when you inject the plastic in there, when it cools, it might have a crystalline structure that warps this part over this way and so it doesn't work the way it was expected to. Or even when you're machining, like you take a solid block of peak and you cut out the part that you want, the heat and everything from that bit is gonna change the crystallization and make it warp too. So it's overall just a very difficult material to work with. And so being able to 3D print some interesting geometries or some stuff that you couldn't even before if it's hollow or just 
3D printing it because it's more efficient and cheaper and faster than the other alternatives, or it couldn't be done in the other alternatives. Uh, and then I've seen parts go from like $800 a part, and then we did it, and it was like $14 in material, and I think it was like two to three hours of machine time. And so the cost savings, you know, the, the, the businesses we sell to can reduce their costs on these parts so much, especially smaller parts in general, you know, under the size of an orange. Um, it's, it's incredible what can be done. And then there's, there's bigger parts can be done too, uh, where instead of, you can't necessarily get a block of peak that's, you know, this big, but you can extrude peak that big if you dial in your settings and everything right and you have the right machines, check out visionminer.com slash printers. We have a variety of high temperature 3D printers that specialize in these materials. It's all we do. It's really enabling a lot of new uh, parts that couldn't even be done before because you could never get a piece or a chunk of peak that was that big. Someone developed a slicer. It was like proprietary within the company, but it took into account warping and it changed the way it sliced for that material to counteract the warping, it was relativity space. Relative, oh. And it was a they metal made a printer. slicer? It was for their metal printer. And they took oh, into yeah, account yeah. the yep. geometries, yep. and they printed it with weird wiggles, knowing it would warp, to counter warp it. Right. Ooh, we need right. that. Yeah. Uh, for soft. peak, that would be huge. The software in this industry is, is massive, uh, the predictability of the materials. You know, why isn't there a perfect profile for peak? Well, because every geometry is different, and if you have a sharp corner, it's gonna behave differently from a round circle or a flat part. Um, and there's just, it just hasn't been developed that long. There's a lot of companies working on it. There's AI, there's machine learning. Mm -hmm. There's so much more technology out there. There should be a video yeah. where you go into like, what is the future of slicing? What is the future of slicing? Uh, uh, counteracting warping. Mm -hmm. On that note, we are going to do a video here uh, very soon on uh, the differences between slicers and for FDM and what you should look at and what to consider when you're choosing your slicer. Now, one thing I see a lot that people make a comparison that's kind of a misnomer is that, well, is this part the same in, in metal as it is in this material in the same geometry? It's like, well, you usually no. Uh, but the beauty of 3D printing is that you can add things like uh, an I-beam or extra geometry or slightly more size in whatever way you want because it's 3D printing and make that part stronger than the metal part would have been. But you wouldn't, you know, you'd have to go from like, a, you know, a sheet metal to a, a five axis CNC and then your part cost goes through the roof versus you 3D print and you modify the same part slightly and then you've got a stronger part than the metal counterpart would have ever been. So that's another thing in 3D printing. You can replace metal with the same part but a slightly different geometry and you can actually hit those numbers. A huge part of it is designing for 3D printing. If you have the part that you want to CNC and you give it to us or put it to your printer to 3D print, there are small changes you can make. They can't necessarily be done at least easily with uh, subtractive CNCing that you can add to these parts that work great with 3D printing that make it unbelievably strong. Yeah, it's huge, it's huge. So uh, designing for 3D printing. A whole nother deal. You gotta, you gotta think differently, you know, when you're designing for manufacturing, you know, whether it's sheet metal or wood or, or other materials, you know, with 3D printing, it really opens up the possibilities, mainly because it's additive. So you're not taking away a bunch of material and going through, you don't have to start with a block and cut it all away. If you want a specific shape, you can deposit whatever you want and create that. Now there are other factors like layers and I, like you were mentioning isotropic strength factors where the layer line, the layers are generally weaker than the X and the Y axis. Uh, PCTG, you know, fixes that significantly. Um, but yeah, to do all, we need to get go way into generative design. Generative design is pretty cool. It's very cool. Yeah, that's basically where you have uh, so there's topology optimization and generative design. They're very very similar. You get parts that look organic and things like that. Uh, topology optimization is taking the current part and removing as much material as possible to get the needed strength. Generative design is starting with here are my bolt holes and here's the restrictions of the space that I have, generate the strongest part you can. Figure it out, computer. Yeah, and then it creates this crazy organic looking shape. Anyway. No, what do you, I want you guys to tell us what you want to hear us talk about. 
we'll rant about it. But uh, give us ideas. What do you need to know or have always wondered? Yeah. This video, as always, is sponsored by us, visionminer.com, where we sell 3D printers, 3D scanners, high temperature materials, and functional stuff for you and your business to make more money and manufacture more easily. And we're always here to help. We love answering your questions. You can email us or give us a call. We are always here. Any final thoughts? Buy 22 IDEX. They're awesome. They are awesome. And we're shipping again out of Ukraine. Lots of new videos coming on that. So stay tuned. Thank you so much for watching. Have a positive rest of your day. And we'll see you on the next video.